Welcome everyone to this Caliper Ingredients presentation on working with CBD in a regulated marketplace presented by Justin Singer, Chief Executive Officer and co-founder of Caliper Foods. My name is Jolene Jacobs and I am the General Manager of Caliper Ingredients and I'm thrilled to introduce you all to Justin. But before that, here are a couple housekeeping items. Please ask questions. There is a chat feature on your screen to send us questions throughout the presentation. Justin will answer as many as he can live towards the end of the presentation. But know that if he doesn't get to your question, we will follow up with you directly. Also, we plan to have a recorded version of this live presentation available at Nutri Ingredients USA and Caliper Ingredients websites. You will receive an email once these are available. The Caliper Ingredients team also welcomes the opportunity to speak with you and your organization directly at any time. Please email us to schedule a meeting to learn about how we can be of service to your team or your brand. And now to introduce today's presenter, Justin Singer. Justin is the CEO and co-founder of Caliper Foods, a pioneering company in the cannabinoid industry and a parent company to Caliper Ingredients. Justin is also the co-founder of Stillwater Brands, a leading cannabis company, edibles company in Colorado. Prior to found, founding Caliper, Justin spent four years teaching innovation theory and high growth entrepreneurship at Columbia University, while also working on product, strategy, and operations for a variety of early stage startups. He began his career as an investor with IA Ventures, a seed stage venture capital firm investing in technology companies that create competitive advantage through data. Justin holds an MBA in finance from Columbia Business School, a JD in telecommunications law from Columbia Law School, and a BA in operations management from the University of Michigan. Thank you for being with us today, Justin. I'm gonna now pass it over to you. Cool. Cool. Thank you, Jolene. Really appreciate it. Um, and thank you, everybody, for being here today. Uh, this is an exciting time in cannabinoids and CBD, and uh, hopefully we can help you think through all of the complexities of this space in an intelligent way. Uh, one thing to note is that this is not going to be a 101 presentation. We sort of assume that People have been interested in this space for a couple of years now and have been looking around. But if you are just getting started and you're looking for some background information, I invite you to check out some previous presentations that I've given on the topic over the years, including the ABCs of CBD from early last year at the Sausland Trends Conference and CBD Sources of Quality uh, presented last year at Supply Side West. So I'm going to start off just contextualizing a bit who we are at Caliper Ingredients and why you should or may decide to listen to us. Uh, because before you look for anything, I believe you should look for a mind at work. So what we are, we are a functional ingredients company focused on cannabinoids, not a hemp company trying to figure out ingredients. We have been food from the beginning. We believe cannabinoids represent a new category of functional ingredients on par with probiotics not just CBD, not just THC, but we believe these are the leading edge of a much larger category that has profound opportunity over the next 5, 10, 15 years. Uh, we believe in taking a science-based approach to this remarkable health and wellness opportunity. If you're going to do something at scale, you got to do it with consistency. You got to do it with uh, rigor. You have to do it with science. And how do we back all that up? Well, it's all about the people. Um, you heard from Jolene. Jolene is our general manager. Uh, she comes to us from Evolve Biosystems, where she led their entry of uh, Jolene. Do you want to talk a little bit more about that? But Jolene led their entry of in vivo into uh, hospital systems, which was a non-prescribed infant probiotic. She also spent time at Laprina Nutrition and Mead Johnson before that on the Enfamil lines. Uh, our director of R and D, Keith Wolfel. Uh, Keith has been with us for four or five years now. He was actually the f very first food hire and the person who made us into a food company. Uh, he came to us from Mars Health and Nutrition Venture Group. Uh, he then put his mind to work on Ripple Technology. That is our dissolvable THC and CBD powder available in Colorado. But while he was at Mars, Keith worked on Cocovia line, the flavanols. He worked on Marathon Bars by Mars. 
long background in functional ingredients and scale up for those ingredients and products. Uh, Petros Levis recently joined us as our director of manufacturing quality. He comes to us from Danone White Wave. He used to lead the Horizon Organics. Uh, it was director of research and innovation for Horizon Organics and led their pilot plant operations. Uh, he's also the former lead of Medallion Labs, which is General Mills Sensory Unit. Um, his experience stretches Green Giant, Pillsbury, Hagadas, Nature Valley, you name it, he seems to have worked on it. And uh, Victor Zessiger is our head of food safety, he comes to us from 20 years at Eurofins and Silica Mario, where he reached level of VP and has been deeply involved with all sorts of food science and food laboratory analysis. Uh, additional people on our team, brands and companies they've worked with, Conagra, Mondelez, Church and Dwight Craft from, and major product lines from Vitafusion to Trident to Lucerne. Um, that's from production to scale up to quality and R&D. And then we have additional legal and regulatory help as well. Besides the time that Petra's put in, White Wave and Medallion on the regulatory side, we also have our in-house counsel who comes from Molson, Coors and DeVita. So when I say we are a food and a functional food company, I mean it, it's the people, it's not just the presentation. How does that manifest in what we offer? Well, we have three major business lines. We have a commercial ingredients line, which is what I'm talking to you about today. Uh, our B2B arm supplies standardized shelf stable formulations of water soluble CBD ingredients to quality focused food, beverage and cosmetic manufacturers and supplement as well. The idea there is that you have a whole business built around quality, around substantiation, around compliance. Just because you're getting into this new space with this new opportunity doesn't mean you should sacrifice any of the hard work you've put in on those levels. We are designed to sell to all of those components, not just to provide a product that doesn't have this requisite documentation. Uh, we also have a consumer branded goods line under Caliper CBD. The Caliper CBD is a precisely dosed zero calorie clean label CBD powder packet that dissolves instantly into any food or beverage. It's available in 10 packs, 30 packs and two packs uh, for sale at any point, any part of the store. And the goal there is just to provide something consistent, backed by science, backed by strong clinical research and the simplest form of CBD that actually works. All of this effort in on the caliper side all comes from IP generated on our THC affiliate side, which is Stillwater Brands with uh, Ripple Edibles. So that now is three strong product lines, Ripple Dissolvables, Ripple Quick Sticks, and Ripple Gummies. Uh, some of the leading edibles in Colorado, Ripple Dissolvables is the number one, two, and three best-selling beverage skew in the state and has been for quite a while. We've produced something like six and a half million servings of that product over the last two and a half years and it is easily one of the most successful products in Colorado. And being that close to the consumer has really helped us understand how to produce products that work for consumers, but also fit into manufacturers' needs. And this is how we do it. We, a lot of people in this space are vertically integrated and they take a lot of pride in that. That's great. We have chosen instead to focus on the linchpin areas. So we don't cultivate, we don't extract. We focus on taking what we view as a raw material, CBD, THC, other cannabinoids, but in the context of caliper CBD only, and processing it into a wa standardized water soluble form that is ready for use in food and for human consumption. We then manufacture that into final form factors and or into ingredients, and then those go off to retailers who sell them. So we try and sit right at that leverage point between the consumer, between the retailer and the cultivator extractor all around the food focus. Wait, why ingredient processing? So it's, I'm sure if you've done some investigation into the space, you have seen people are arguing that you can just take some CBD, throw it in and voila, you have some magic pixie dust. You can, and to a point it will sell, but how long and what's the repeat? And in our experience, the answer is it'll sell for the beginning when it's novel, but the repeat will be terrible. And why is that? Well, because when you actually process CBD into a finished ingredient, you get three main benefits. One, you get function, and this is the biggest one. So per the World Health Organization, CBD's native bioavailability may be as low as 6%. That means that the vast majority of CBD consumed in oil and tincture form is excreted without ever entering the bloodstream. Tough to give consumers reliable effect when most of the product you're selling them goes out without ever helping them. Um, 
When you look at caliper, these are based on a preliminary bio PK study that we performed with Colorado State University. It was published in the Journal of Phytotherapy Research. You get 540% more bioavailability in the first 15 minutes when it's in a water soluble format, specifically the caliper soluble format. You get 450% greater bioavailability overall. You get 40% earlier Tmax, 54 minutes versus 90. You just get a more a better experience that doesn't depend on what's in your stomach and actually gives consumers the value that they're trying to buy. Uh, number two on ingredient processing, standardization. Extracts, even isolates, will vary in cannabinoid content and organoleptics across extractors and batches. It is extremely hard to standardize an agricultural product, especially one without any real oversight or controls or nomenclature or standards of identity. Uh, and number three, wine ingredient processing, format. Water-based applications meet consumers where they are, low-fat and low-calorie products. If you've got an oil-based uh, product like a CBD oil or a CBD isolate, these are all lipids, your product choices are pretty narrow. This is why so many THC marketplaces started off with sin foods like uh, butters, brownies, and cookies because it was very easy to solubilize into butter and they were essentially fat-based matrices. But CBD is a wellness product, it's a health product. The future of it is in low fat, low calorie foods. And in order to get those, you have to put it into a water soluble format first. So let's talk about the state of regulation. Um, yeah, shrug, that is basically summing it up. Today's regulatory environment in a nutshell, hemp derived CBD is legal to produce, but not legal to market. I know that's confusing. The farm bill solved the supply side, but FDA intransigence has arrested the demand side. So it can be there, it just can't be sold. I have a law degree. This confuses me just as much as I think anybody. Um, practically though, CBD is illegal like speeding, not illegal like murder. Non-drug CBD products are clearly tolerated. FDA has sent out 22 uh, letters around CBD in the last year in 2019 out of tens of thousands of products out there. They have focused on specific things and we will talk to that. The point though is that while they are tolerated, they're also not regulated. Certainty in general is just lacking. There are certain things that we know we can't do on the edges. There are certain things we know we can do on the edges. What we don't know is exactly what the federal government will tolerate and why. So, um, and then FDA's de facto enforcement guidelines prioritize disease claims over food fraud. Consumers have been left to fend for themselves against latent product defects. Caveat emptor is back. Uh, for those who skipped Latin, buyer beware. Used to be the case ever going back to the 1906 pure food and drug law that the FDA took responsibility or the precursor organizations to FDA took responsibility for ensuring no latent defects were present in food products. That is defects that consumers couldn't discover on their own. Basically that the label met the package. What was inside, what was on, was on the label. With CBD, that is no longer the case. Um, and that's a real shame. So non-drug CBD tolerated, but not yet regulated. Proceed accordingly. How do we get here? That's a great question. Since the 2018 Farm Bill, regulatory progress has been slow, but inexorable. So for all the fits and starts, there are more starts than fits. Uh, starting with the Farm Bill signing in 2018, the commissioner, got, Scott Gottlieb, said that in view of proliferation of products containing cannabis or cannabis derived substances, the FDA will advance new steps to better define our public health obligations in this area. Good start. Uh, fast forward six months, lawmakers grow impatient for FDA cannabis rules. Senate, Senate Majority Leader McConnell shouting that Congress's intent was clear with the passage of the Farm Bill. These products should be legal and our farmers, producers and manufacturers need clarity. FDA, two weeks later, said pretty much not much. Uh, the agency is committed to evaluating the regulatory frameworks for non-drug uses, including markets, mar products marketed as food and dietary supplements. So amidst a whole lot of nothing, that was a sentence that was actually represented a change. That was a shift. They were on their way to evaluating. Of course, nothing ha happened for another six months until in January, 2020, when HR 5587 was introduced. HR 5587 tried to shortcut FDA's intransigence by simply including hemp-derived cannabinoids like CBD in the definition, of, in the statutory definition of dietary supplements. The bill got uh, some good co-sponsorship, but ultimately didn't get enough traction to really move. 
Although there's indication that in today's environment, where things are quite uncertain and up in the air, it's possible that this might find its way in. And lawmakers don't love to demand that FDA do regulating. They'd rather FDA do that for themselves. But at the same time, they also recognize that while FDA wants three to five years to do rules, rulemaking, that doesn't help the 20 million Americans who are consuming CBD on a daily basis without any oversight. The era of prohibition is over. It's really important for FDA to start getting on board with that. And in the UK, they did get on board with that. So in February of this year, the UK's Food Standards Agency, which is their version of FDA minus the pharmaceutical uh, oversight responsibility, took a couple months using the same information the FDA ha has had from the beginning, and they came out with guidance for the food industry to allow CBD to be placed into products without the same degree of uncertainty or fear of it being taken off of shelves. Um, and you see that in their language here, they're basically requiring products to submit the UK equivalent of NDIs for new dietary ingredients before March, 2021. Um, and they're making certain that yes, they will take the product off the shelves. Great, regulate, remove, or, or those are really the two only coherent options. They also uh, took responsibility for just offering a suggested upper limit of 70 milligrams a day. This was based on information that was submitted to them through GW, through the Epidiolex sub. It's the same information FDA has always had. And then later that month in February, the FDA chief, the third chief since this all began, uh, Director Stephen Hahn, said it would be a fool's game to try to shut down CBD markets. And this was an earthquake. Uh, said the director, we're not going to be able to say you can't use these products. It's a fool's game to try to even approach that. We have to be open to the fact there might be some value, and certainly Americans think that's the case, but we want to get them information to help them make the right decisions. Wonderful. They were moving forward. Unfortunately, the next week, they released the, in writing their policy, which while repeating the same things they've always said, they did drop in one piece of new language that indicates they really were moving forward. And that is this. We are currently evaluating issuance of a risk-based enforcement policy that will provide greater transparency and clarity regarding factors the agency intends to take into account in prioritizing enforcement decisions. Great. Um, unfortunately, that is nice for prioritizing enforcement decisions. That doesn't prioritize food safety, but a little bit is better than nothing. And then on April 7th, one more th piece of good news, the DEA descheduled CBD completely um, from Epidiolex. No longer subject to the Controlled Substances Act. That had long been something that FDA had held up as a reason for why they couldn't regulate as a food was its presence on the CSA, on the schedule. Um, that is no longer, and now you're gonna start seeing it going off label in a number of places. So as you say, while FDA dithers, consumers have been getting conned. Seventy percent in 2017, down to fifty percent in 2019, with eleven percent still containing no CBD whatsoever. Now, the Leafly study was fairly small, uh, and then of 47 products across 47 companies, compared to 84 products from 31 companies by JAMA. But we believe these results are directionally correct, and our own lab testing has proven out similar. Um, at the same time, disease claims are rampant, but mostly ignored. Um, example claims that have drawn warnings include CBD has been shown to be effective in treating Parkinson's, breast cancer, diabetes. These are all terrible claims and deserve to be stamped out for good. But FDA really isn't doing too much work on that front. They did 22 warning letters in 2019 and two in 2020. We believe that if this is going to work, you've got to actually enforce the laws on the book. So widespread in fraud minus meaningful enforcement equals a market for lemons. And for those of you who don't remember your economics classes, the market for lemons is one where the auto dealer knows whether the car is a lemon or not, but you as the consumer have no idea. Therefore, your best bet is to assume it's a lemon. It hurts everybody. And that is the state the market is in right now. But that state where you have lots of people demanding a good, but they can't trust that the good is actually what they are asking for, actually represents an opportunity for people who can break through that credibility gap that FDA has opened up here. So CBD is more than an opportunity. Consumers are already there. I don't know what substance that is not currently regulated in the history of the world that you can actually point to numbers like this on. 26% of US adults have tried CBD in the last two years, and that was in January of last year. 
63% find it extremely or very effective for reducing stress or anxiety, which is the primary millennial use case. 38% find it extremely or very effective for alleviating joint pain, primary boomer use. Again, this is while the CBD is in formats that are very poorly absorbed, which indicates that the people having positive effects either were very sensitive to it or that there was a strong placebo, which is also likely, but also just there was something here that the combination of all these things were working for people. Who already uses CBD? Lots of people. Obviously, 1829, again, this is from January of 2019. We've seen a lot of movement, especially towards the older end of the scale. People are starting to move up there. Um, seniors, boomers, people who just want to feel a bit better. Um, meanwhile, at consumer levels, the data indicate that CBD is fundamentally safe. This is from the WHO's 2018 critical review of cannabidiol and has not been countered by any, any uh, information lately. CBD is generally well tolerated with a good safety profile, no evidence of recreational use or public health related problems. Uh, an orally administered dose of 600 milligrams did not differ from placebo on the addiction research in center inventories. And some of the adverse effects that have been observed and reported more likely relate to interactions with other anti-epileptic drugs. So you've got opportunity, but the industry has failed so far to deliver on its promises. And that opens the door for credible brands. When you take broken trust, you put it in a sea of sameness like tinctures, which is what every product on the market with CBD seems to be. And for good reason, it's the cheapest, easiest to manufacture. And it's the one that is demanded and has the biggest calling among the natural products market where this really originated. That leaves opportunity though, for credible brands who are willing to do something different. So when you go and you talk to lapsed consumers, people who took CBD and stopped and you ask them, what would make you reconsider? If I know it works, great. How do you know if it works? Pharmacokinetic studies and credibility. If it was less expensive, how do you make it less expensive? Scale and people with manufacturing expertise and a little less greed. That would be a credible brand. Meanwhile, potential consumers, what are your reasons for not using CBD? Don't know enough about it. I know a couple of brands that are very good at getting words out to people and getting messages out. That seems to be exactly what brands are made for, to help educate consumers about what they might need to know to make a choice about CBD. They don't know which brand or product to use. Many of the people on this call already have brands or products that have the credibility with consumers that can ask them to come work with them and listen to them. Not sure it works. Again, credible medical studies can help. Credibility of a brand can help. Don't know where to buy it. Yeah, CBD shops are not going to be the end all be all of where these things are sold. Uh, I do expect that this is going to live mostly in retail um, and follow sort of the same distribution lines as caffeine, for instance. So this presentation was about working with CBD in a regulated marketplace. Let's talk about the unregulated marketplace. Let's talk about how to spot a cowboy. These are people who have been operating in CBD as it is the Wild West. And what does that mean when we keep hearing the words Wild West? I am very concerned that people often create a category error where they think, okay, GMP, great. I'm used to working with GMP guys at my sh when I buy my sugars from them. They know everything. They got traceability. Like that should be good. No, it's not. Everything in CBD is up for discussion. So credible vendors, prioritize GMP and CGMP adherence because food safety regulations are written in blood. They label their ingredients accurately and completely because this should be obvious. Consumers need to know and so do you as the brand. They also substantiate all product claims, again, because this should be obvious. You have to substantiate the things you say and do or otherwise we're all just talking. Wild West vendors, on the other hand, cowboys, view GMPs as a box to check rather than a culture to implement because who's checking anyway? It's not the FDA. They label their products inaccurately or incompletely, again, because who's checking? And they make product claims without predication, because who's checking and because it makes money. Selling certainty is the greatest business model known to man. Telling people that your CBD will cure COVID, will cure cancer, is the quickest way to instant revenue. It is also the lowest ethic and the most damaging to the long-term health of the CBD industry. So here are some examples of Wild West behavior, more specific in GMPs and CGMPs. One that's very widespread is failing to qualify upstream vendors and their products. Unregulated markets attract charlatans. Um, the charlatans very often are trying to buy on the spot market. They are trying to broker, they are trying to trade. They really focus 100% on price and they just sort of assume that the underlying asset 
is the same. Well, it's not. I have heard stories, we have, we have seen people who have tried to buy 100 kilos of CBD isolate, assuming that it's of a certain product grade, and when they go, it's flour. That's not quite what they were hoping for. So verify that your CBD vendor has fully qualified their upstream partners, whether farms or extractors, and has a sound clearance process for each inbound batch. Spot market CBD buys are bad news bears. You see those reported for dollar amounts, and yeah, they're cheap. They could also be sugar. When you are trying to buy documentation and traceability, that costs them more. Wild West behavior includes choosing lab partners based on factors other than competence. Results shopping is a real thing. The start in THC, it's migrated to CBD. Even if it weren't, cannabinoid analysis is a novel field and labs are learning as they go. We spend a lot of time working with labs on, methodol on methods, on proving out different methods of analysis and validations. Especially when you work with complex food matrices like solubles, these are not straightforward. God, everybody is getting better at this as we go. So verify that your CBD vendor has chosen their lab partners for their competence, integrity, not their cost and pliability. Finally, under investing in quality programs or simply not investing at all. GMP certification is table stakes. I, it's kind of funny when people are like, we are GMP certified. Good, good. You should be. But vendors should also already be well on their way to SQF level two or FISMA compliance. Quality programs are expensive and very few vendors have the capital to devote to them. But quality programs are what keeps consumers safe from foodborne illness. They are exceptionally important. Um, you are a large company, you invest in it, you expect the same from your vendors. So our recommendations here, involve your quality team early, make sure they have plenty of conversations with whoever is responsible for quality at your vendor side and verify with your own eyes, then maybe trust. Wild West behavior and ingredient labeling. Uh, one, selectively disclosing ugly ingredients and preservatives. Many vendors today take advantage of the lack of oversight to play fast and loose with ingredient declarations. Um, and there's lots of ways they can do this. You can either misclassify components as process aids, or you can claim black box processes that avoid the need for emulsifiers altogether. Point is the bad behavior is rampant. Don't brush off evasive responses to questions about declarations. Don't just believe people when they tell you that everything that you've learned about food science in your life is wrong because they've invented something new. Okay, this is not cryptocurrency, it's food. You can understand this, I promise. When you see red flags, run. Obscuring variation in lesser cannabinoid content. So distillate derived broad and full spectrum ingredients can be standardized to CBD content, but lesser cannabinoids will vary by extractor and batch. If a vendor claims a consistent cannabinoid cocktail using distillates rather than isolate recomposition, demand that they prove it, and not just once. Make them prove it across multiple batches, across time spanning bio different biomass inputs. The whole point is anybody can do something well once on a bench. Can you do it time after time after time? Do you have control of your production process? Do you have control of your cannabinoid content, of your organoleptics? How do those changes ramify down the line in your shelf stability, in your physical stability. These are all open questions and none of them can just be brushed off. You have to run every experiment right now. And finally, playing fast and loose with C of A's. It's a too common practice to play games with levels of detection or quantitation. So you can claim non-detectable levels of THC, pesticides, heavy metals, solvents. It's really, you need to go through every line of your vendor's C of A and make sure you're on board with why, which methods they chose, what resolutions they chose, what their thresholds are, and which analytes they're going after. There is no standardization here. Again, FDA is not out there saying, this is what makes for a commodity uh, isolate. You have to make those decisions yourself. We've spent a lot of time looking at these. We've picked some of the best things from different states, Department of Health and Agriculture have gone through these. And then we've generally gone, to cut it in half to try and make those levels ev even safer. It's hard work but you've got to do it to feel comfortable that you have control of this process. So complete and accurate labeling is the only path forward and beware soluble ingredients with decks that don't pass the smell test. Again, food science. If people have discovered a different way to skin the cat when it comes to emulsifiers, there's no reason to screw around in CBD. They can go sell it to everyone else on earth. Really believe what is worth believing. Wild West behavior and product claims. Some of our favorites, um, enumerate shelf stability data. How does a one-year-old company claim a one-year shelf life? I don't know, I'm sitting here shrugging like the icon. If the answer is accelerated testing, ask those protocols, ask how those protocols were validated. If the answer is preservatives, that's not an answer. 
The science is too new to rely on assumptions and guesswork. The only way to validate shelf stability is to actually validate shelf stability. You have to run the experiments. Pharmacokinetics that defy biology. You can go read up, uh, ingested water takes at least five minutes to appear in the bloodstream. Our bodies just don't work much faster than that. Um, claims of immediate absorption based on solubility or nanoparticulates or any other buzzword really are just patently false. Pharmacokinetic claims sh must be verified with rinical, rigorous clinical research from credible institutions. If it can be verified, it has to be verified and PK can be verified. Dynamics will also vary by formulation, so be extremely careful about generalizing any study results. You can't just say that water soluble is X percent bioavailable. We have seen different formulations of water soluble products will have different absorption curves. You've got to run the tests. I know it's expensive, but you have to do it to make those claims with substantiation and feel comfortable about it and be good ethics at the same time. Um, and then finally, organic schmorganic. I this has been a constant one for our company, and I really am trying to answer this. Um, it is plausible to certify or create a full spectrum tincture as organic, but THC distillates are just a different story. THC free distillates. Today's production scale chromatography methods rely on non organic solvents to separate out THC. That doesn't pass the organic test. While reverse phase chromatography could arguably resolve this issue, we haven't seen it yet in a production environment. And also, CBD, FDA does not allow CBD to be used in food and, and non-drug products today, as it is, which would also harm the organic certification. So, I know companies are making this claim. We are wide open to the idea that it is possible. If you are an organic certifier and you think you know how to do this, please, we would be glad to listen. Like I said, our manufacturing is run by the guy who used to run the largest or milk pro organic milk processor in the country. And he is confused as heck about this. So we are open to it. We just don't see how this works, but we are open to being proven wrong. Extraordinary claims demand extraordinary evidence. And when everything is novel, nothing can be assumed. Finally, best practices for developing regulation ready CBD products. Number one, don't shortcut due diligence. Um, get out of the building when conditions allow and you can do so safely. We are all on lockdown and we understand that. But anyone can sound convincing on a phone or video call, but you can't know the quality of a vendor until you've examined their operation for yourself. Visit every vendor you're seriously considering and bring a technical expert with you to vet their claims. Don't get pulled in by BS. I. One of the best things that we heard was from somebody from one of the nation's largest tea companies who came to our facility and said, hey, I've been to all of your competitors. They all say they're doing what you're doing. You're the only one who's doing what you're doing. That was the one of the better moments in our company's history. I'm not sure it's still true today. I hope this industry is getting better, but I think it's still true that you can't know until you see it for yourself. So verify, then trust. A common category and error in CBD is to treat vendors as in space as you would any other regulated vendor. That means to give them a presumption of good faith and regularity. This is food science though. You can understand it. Start with skepticism and work towards belief. It will save you time. It'll save you money and it'll save you headaches. And then finally, when vendors show you who they are, believe them. If a vendor makes unsubstantiated claims that don't jibe with chemistry or biology, how can you trust anything else they say? To the right here, I've got some claims that I pulled off of a website from a fairly prominent CBD company that I find ridiculous. We encapsulate full spectrum CBD oil in nano bubbles of water so that it instantly absorbs upon contact with the mouth. No. Um, the taste of CBD getting sweeter as it approaches the correct dose, a function of the CB2 receptors in the tongue, modulating, indicating the optimal dosage amount of CBD in the body for that day. That is nonsense. Nonsense and balderdash, all of this is. Guys, again, it's food. It is functional ingredients. There are no shortcuts here. You've just got to do good food science, good processing, good manufacturing, and be smart with your claims and your risk st strategy. And then be smart about your vendors. Lots of people are going to tell you all sorts of things because they want to move faster than you practically can. The goal here for you is to move faster by having less rework. Find the right partner off the bat. 
put in every, put in all the work, turn every page, never assume anything, turn every gosh darn page, and you will get out to market quicker than your competitor with a high quality product that you can stand behind and scale. That is the goal. Other things to do, identify and clear potential blockers early. Uh, legal and regulatory, get them involved. Sooner or later, they're gonna have a say, it's CBD. Working with CBD today entails regulatory risk. There's no way around that, but that risk can be mitigated in some ways, e.g. by avoiding claims and obfuscated in others by labeling full spectrum hemp extract. Getting buy-in from your regulatory team or on your development path early on is the fastest route to market. We have seen these project tank, projects tanked at the end because regulatory wasn't bought in to something that could have been cleared much earlier. I, I know that's often not the preferred path for innovation, but in this case, it's the smartest one. Uh, quality and procurement. The CBD supply chain is a mess right now, and regulation would, at least in the short term, only strain it further. There's a glut of raws, that's CBD isolates and hemp oils, uh, with attractive pricing available on the spot market, but they generally lack traceability, testing, quality control, residual solvent analysis, all of that good stuff that, get, that you want your upstream vendors to warranty to. So also, spot buys don't scale. That's not gonna go very far. It's nice if you can get one product out there, but how are you going to actually build a supply line that can support what you're hoping to do and what you're hoping to invest on the marketing side? Remember, you're not just buying an ingredient, you're buying the documentation and warranties that come with that ingredient as well. Finally, co-manufacturers, distributors, and retailers. Start talking to them. Every player in your downstream supply chain will have an opinion or policy on what they're willing to accept. Some will accept topicals, but not ingestibles. Walgreens is in this category. Others will accept products labeled with hemp extract, but not CBD. That's Amazon, where you see all, lots of people talking about hemp extract, 20 milligrams of hemp extract, because that's a thing. Still others will accept products labeled full spectrum CBD and a broad spectrum CBD, but not CBD. This is something with many natural retailers, even though these are all CBD. It's frustrating. It's ridiculous. It's confusing. There is no coherence, no guidance to any of this. But in the absence of clear FDA guidance, that's just part of the process. If all of this were solved, this wouldn't be an opportunity. Opportunity is when you have a market that is unstructured and masked with demand that is huge and waiting for the market to structure up to serve it. So the takeaway here, securing alignment from all stakeholders up front is painful, but it's well worth the effort on a project like this. Then don't forget about testing. Potency. Complex matrices like soluble CBD are novel for most food labs. We've done a lot of work with our vendors um, to help them understand how to test CBD. It's not just turnkey. It takes time. It takes effort. And every new food matrix will, matrix will require additional effort. So many will have difficulty delivering accurate results without help. Vendors with their own internal analytical capabilities can help and validate test methods that deliver uh, consistent results for your specific product matrix and then hand those methods off to accredited third-party labs for ongoing analysis. This is part of our standard SOP now is we help develop the test protocols and then we hand them off so that you can get that third-party testing that you need to feel comfortable from hopefully a certified accredited lab that does more than just THC and CBD. Um, and you can feel good that they are doing that independently. We're just helping them to get their consistent results. Um, organoleptics. Can't say it enough. Distillation science is not nearly as consistent as advertised. We've learned that any vendor can do one run with acceptable sensory characteristics, but a vanishing few can control sensory characteristics across batches. So when you're evaluating vendors, you got to look for lines, not dots. You need to know how they will perform over time, not how they performed once. One of our rules of thumb is that we don't even want to evaluate vendors until we see three to five batches of the product they're asking us to evaluate. And those batches should be spread out over the course of at least six to eight weeks. You wanna see the lines, how have they improved? What changes? What are the brackets here? Not just, hey, wow, that's a really good sample. Can you do more of those? Chances are they can. And anyway, so the takeaways here, analytical capabilities complete the product development feedback loop. You have those in-house, you can develop products faster. And without in-house ex expertise, vendors are just shooting in the dark. Finally, allow time for a healthy process. I have been sitting here talking about all the things that are screwy and difficult with this process. Don't expect everything to go smoothly. Packaging, pH, flavor systems, pasteurization temperatures, these all affect the physical, chemical, and sensory characteristics and stability of CBD products. To what degree? 
is unknown. Some we have know better than others, but ultimately this is an all science of first impression. We're developing knowledge fast, but what we don't know still exceeds what we do. So take all the usual false starts that come with a new product development cycle, then multiply it by a regulatory mess, and now you're talking about CBD. So have time. You want the healthy process. You don't want to get rushed because you're fearing of missing out. And that's where we come to their final point. Take advantage of what is certain. Development is legal, period. You can bring CBD into your business. You can work with it. You can formulate with it. You can put it on shelf. You can do anything except market it. That's where things get tricky. That's the commercialization piece that FDA is holding up on. If CBD is in your plans, there's nothing stopping you from kicking off development now and being ready to launch when FDA is ready to regulate. You can go out, you can start seeing all the different vendors. You can test products from different people. You can test different formulations. You can do some market research, all of that. It is all okay. But if you wait till after FDA says go to even start developing, think about how long that development cycle is. Think about where the market moves in that time. There's just nothing stopping anybody from putting products on on your own shelf, in your own cabinets, just ready to go out to grocers as soon as they're ready to take them. So takeaway here, bad process can produce good, good products, but good process is a much better batting average. And with that, I'm going to open it up for questions and... And I'm going to jump in here briefly while Justin has a chance to look through the questions. Um, first of all, thank you for all of those that have typed in questions. Um, you can continue to type in questions. Justin will field them live. If we do not get to your specific question, just know that we will follow up with you. But we have about 10 minutes um, that we're going to take uh, maybe five to eight questions. Um, Justin, as you start to scroll through those, maybe I can just serve one up to you. Um, and that mm -hmm. will give you a chance to A, answer, but also scroll a little bit more. So one of the questions we received, um, is CBD illegal because it comes from hemp slash cannabis? So hemp derived CBD is legal under the 2018 farm bill. Cannabis is actually a different, legally speaking, a different plant, if not horticulturally, somewhat of a different plant. Legally, cannabis is marijuana, is anything with a THC content on a dry weight basis over 0.3%. Hemp is something under 0.3%. So cannabis sativa is the genus of the plant from which both hemp and marijuana derive. You can have CBD that derives from marijuana. That's technically epidiolex. You can have CBD that derives from hemp. That is all of the hemp in the marketplace that's grown under the 2018 Farm Bill. Um, so is that legal just because it's defined from hemp? It is, again, it is legal to possess. Um, and now that CBD, even marijuana derived CBD has been removed from the CSA, all CBD of all forms is legal to at least possess. It's the commercialization piece again, that gets tricky because now you're invoking FDA oversight uh, and clearance of products. Perfect. Let me serve you up one more um, and then I'll give you a chance to sift through the questions. Again, anyone else that has questions, please send them through. Um, but here's a great question. Is it challenging to make good tasting products with CBD and what makes the product taste good? It is very challenging. One of the biggest problems with CBD is that CBD is extremely bitter. I mean, our food scientists compare it to caffeine and not favorably. Caffeine is less bitter than CBD. This is the most bitter substance than any of them I've ever worked with. Um, I've seen plenty of vendors on the isolate side claiming that theirs has a clean taste. I mean, it's cleaner, but ultimately there still really is uh, a strong bitter component. Once you start adding in other cannabinoids, other flavor, pro they have their own flavor profiles. They are generally very strong. They are long lasting. Um, terpenes and other things that you might get from hemp itself has also got a very green flavor to it. So there's a lot of work to be done on managing that bitterness, especially at dose levels that have some level of efficacy for consumers. So when you get up beyond that, like five to 10 milligram to the 20, 30, 40 milligram doses, it gets, it gets very, very challenging. Um, we do as much as possible on our end to minimize the effect of that flavor, to minimize that bitterness so that you don't have to formulate around it so much um, or with 
such a heavy hand. The goal is to let formulators work with the most mild or gentle of hands as possible in managing the CBD content. But if you get a good standardized uh, base, your job is easier, but you're still a formulator and I'm sure you have high standards. So there will always be little quirks that you're gonna work through, but yes, it's difficult. Great, thank you. So Justin, I'm gonna give you a minute to sift through the next question because there's a lot coming in. Um, just as Justin looks at the next question that he's gonna answer, I just wanna remind everyone that we are recording this webinar. So we will be posting it uh, via Nutri Ingredients USA website, as well as through caliperingredients.com website. If you have registered for the website or for the webinar, you will automatically receive a notification once those presentations are available. Um, we are also happy to share a PDF um, of the webinar as well, um, of the slides that you saw. So we will have that available specifically on our caliperingredients.com website. So stay tuned for that. Um, we are super excited just about the engagement level that we have seen throughout this webinar and the questions that keep coming in. I'm gonna pass it now over to Justin. Um, Justin, do you see a couple of questions that you wanna tackle? Yeah, so let's start with uh, what are your thoughts on what FDA's position will be regarding isolates versus broad full spectrum CBD products? I don't think FDA will distinguish between these. Um, frankly, I think that CBD is CBD. Um, full spectrum CBD is like saying fruit salad blueberries. They, it is CBD plus a bunch of other stuff. I don't really buy the idea that if FDA wants to regulate blueberries, that fruit salads are suddenly going to fly under the radar and no one, and they're not going to care about fruit salads that contain blueberries. CBD is CBD. Um, a lot of this argumentation came, a lot of the ideas around full and broad spectrum came from the red yeast rice and statin debates uh, around Pharmanex in the late 90s. The idea was that, hey, this is just red yeast rice. It's not statin. Uh, therefore, you can't regulate it, even though statin is a drug. Well, FDA's point was twofold. One, that the rice was grown specifically to promote the statin content. Therefore, it deserved to be treated as a statin producer, as a statin product. And two, that the statin content was marketed on the package. Well, A, all hemp today that's extracted for CBD was grown to produce CBD. It's feminized seeds. Uh, and two, I don't know anybody who's trying to go out there and sell CBD products without actually labeling the CBD content. So, I, I just don't see a reason behind uh, the isolate full, full broad spectrum distinction in terms of legality. I could see certain market segments opening up around full spectrum. You could conceivably do something like whiskey where you can you strongly regulate the process of production and therefore you put the axis of competition around the agricultural side of things. So like if you have a dumb process, you can only use, you know, these cold organic solvents. It has to be through a cold pressing. You can't add flavor agents, something like that. Then it's just purely like who can grow the stuff that comes out the other end with the best composition or the most efficacious composition or flavoring. That would make sense to me. Broad spectrum makes no sense to me whatsoever. That's a extremely constructed substance, requires all sorts of solvents. If you're gonna do anything with that, you may as well go with isolation and reconstitution. So you're focused entirely on the uh, target components and you're not running the risk of residual solvents and uncharacterized uh, headspace. Um, let's see, what else? What do I see as the first major governmental step to clearing up the uncertainty in the market? It's FDA. I, I, like, I wish that there were some other way around this. FDA has to say that this is okay. I, I think they are in a very difficult position right now. They would like to put people through something like the NDI process, which I'm, is a fine process, except it's a process that was developed for an industry where you have a controlled means of production, like one lab that's producing one product. And you're trying to say like, hey, can I bring this one product in? Well, yeah, like that's controlled, that's fine, that works. But CBD is already here. It is broadly distributed. Like I said, 20 million Americans a day are already consuming it. You cannot put this genie back in the bottle. All you can do is regulate it. So I don't even see the NDI forcing everyone to submit to NDIs, especially since FDA doesn't have a history of actually penalizing people for not 
going through the N NDI process as being a solution that actually furthers consumer health and safety. I, I think you've just got to hold people to the same laws and rules as everybody else in the functional ingredient food and supplement marketplace. Could those laws be short up? Yeah. Should they? Yeah. It's been 30 years since Deche, but that's a different question. I, I think like once you get it under regulation, then you start getting better data. Then you start working with operators who are operating in good faith, who are in control, who care about being regulated and see the value of it. Then you can start improving the overall regulation of the space. Um, how can suppliers and food companies help? You can lobby FDA. You can lobby Congress. You can lobby HHS. Um, there are bills that we are working with uh, in Congress. Um, there's part of the CARES Act is trying to get, uh, well, that's mostly safe banking, but HR 5587 is still on the board. It's very much a sledgehammer, but FDA is just taking too long for this. So a sledgehammer is sort of how it's got to be. That's how Deshea came into being. And that's probably going to be the way that this is going to come into being. I, I think lobbying them through retailers, lobbying them through your elected representatives, and just saying, we need the certainty here. We can't have 47 different definitions of what is CBD, what is full spectrum, what is broad spectrum. The food supply chain is the archetype of federal regulation. It is interstate commerce to its core. It needs FDA to step up and be a food regulator again, not just a pharma regulator. Um, and that's going to require public pressure um, and pressure from brands. Um, many of the people on this call, you have legislative and regulatory uh, helpers, whether it's outsource or insource, please bring them to bear. Give me a call. Talk to me. Be glad to coordinate efforts. Uh, it's just so important to bring clear regulation to the space. One thing that I say over and over again is that 22 guys beating the hell out of each other on a field doesn't suddenly become a professional football game. You need referees. You need rules. You need regulations. You need salary caps, contracts, all of the above. That comes from regulation. That's what's lacking right now. Great. Um, Thank you, Justin. You know what? We're going to run tight on time. Why don't you pick out one more question to answer um, while you scan through? Um, just another reminder. Um, first of all, thank you for all of the questions that have come through. I feel like we've barely scratched the surface, but we will make sure that we follow up on each and every one personally. Also, we've had a lot of great feedback about this webinar, so we appreciate that. We did share Justin's contact information at the start of the webinar. We will send out his email address again um, when you receive the follow-up. We're happy to have you reach out to Justin with any questions that you have specific to your organization. We're also happy to have our ingredients team reach out to see how we can support these conversations and this innovation in your organization. Um, I'll give Justin's email um, one more time before we have him answer uh, a last question, but it's Justin. J U S T I N dot singer S I N G E R at caliper C A L I P E R dot life. Um, again, we'll send that out. I know a couple of you had asked, um, had missed his email address at the beginning of the call, um, but let's have Justin answer one more question um, and then we will sign off for today. Thank you all. Sure. So thanks, Jolene. The last question here, have you noticed any loss of CBD in canned products, i.e. drinks? I've heard claims of CBD binding to the metals in cans. We've heard those claims too. Uh, that's not a function of CBD. That's a function of poor emulsions. Will CBD bind to uh, certain linings in cans? Sure. But only if the emulsion in which it's being held is broken. Um, generally speaking, poor shelf stability in terms of CBD content speaks more to the overall uh, processing quality and emulsion quality than it does to any inherent characteristics of CBD. We have some shelf stability trials on seltzers in cans uh, under different conditions that are well past six months and have shown no degradation. But we have seen that once that emulsion does break, then it starts e the liner will start eating the CBD fast. But if you can keep your emulsion stable, you can keep the CBD in the can. Awesome. And on that note, Justin, do you want to wrap things up? Yeah. Thank you guys so much. Thank you, everybody. Really appreciate the question. If I didn't get to it live, we will get to it uh, through an email. Please feel free, as Jolene said, leave, send me an email, drop me a line or drop Jolene a line. We are here to help. It's our belief that education is going to be the key to unlocking this opportunity. 
um, and just realism and honesty. We've all seen what has happened with the bubble last year. Um, we all know what we're going through right now. This is a public health moment. And we think there is no better time to talk about things that aren't panaceas, but just make life better. That's enough. And we think it's the greatest opportunity we've ever seen. So thank you all for your interest and look forward to talking to you all soon. Thank you. Everyone have a wonderful day. Stay safe and we'll be talking to you soon.